Hello everybody, good morning and welcome to our web chat. We are here in Milan, the US consulate with Donna Schieder. Donna is the president-elect of IFLA, uh, the Global Federation of Library Associations, and until March 2015, she was the deputy information officer at the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress. So uh, today we will be talking uh, about the IFLA trend report with Donna. So, Donna, can you explain us a little bit? Well, yes, thank you very much, and um, welcome, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here speaking to you. Even though I can't see you, I know you're there. Um, IFLA is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, so our members are library associations around the world and the, li and the libraries um, around the world as well. So we like to refer to ourselves as the global voice of libraries. Uh, and in that regard, and we decided in, in 2012, I believe, that we needed to really have an understanding of how libraries and society are changing and the impact that that's having on libraries. And so we put some expert panels together, and the experts came from a wide variety of, back, of backgrounds, uh, including uh, backgrounds with people in internet governments, governance, the law field, uh, educators, um, a, a wide variety of people, economists. And uh, they looked at all of the literature, and there is so much literature out there right now about trends. And uh, what they were able to do, uh, working over a period of a year and a half, is synthesize all this information down into five um, major societal trends. And with these trends, then, we are able to start conversations around the world about how these trends are impacting that society's libraries, because obviously it's different in different country, different for different cultures. So uh, some of these trends I think you'll, you'll recognize as, as um, in, in some ways we in America use the expression no-brainers, you know. Technology is changing people's ability to access information. Of course it is. But, but when you delve down into that more deeply, you, you find um, uh, the, the essence of the impacts of some of those things, which is, while it may be becoming easier for people to access information, not everyone is able to access it. Um, one of the things that we found is that uh, there are 35% of the people, only 35% of the people in the world have direct access to the internet. And uh, I think here in Italy, it is 45.8%, according to the latest World Bank figures, 45.8% of the people of Italy do not have direct access um, uh, to information, meaning directly through the internet. But access is also more than just having technology. Obviously, you need to be literate. You need to be able to read, and that is in many countries. And you need to be able to read, not only read the information, but be able to use it. So, so in these trends, such as, such as this one, we find these dichotomies, these, these um, uh, this trend can either be used for the good, or it could be setting the world on a course that would be not so good. This gap may either widen or we can help to close it. Another, another trend that is very interesting is around online learning and the revolution that online learning is having on um, acad the academic models of how people um, get the skills that they need to get, to get jobs, to get educated, etc. And it's really possible through, again, through technology, to, to bring high quality education and courses to so many more people because universities and most and professors especially no longer have boundaries. They no longer have the boundary of the campus. They no longer have the need to, to work with students physically in the same space. So this, this expands opportunities for people, but again, it also can have some deleterious effects. 
So um, the other the other trend I think that's worth mentioning, particularly because many of you are, are working with governments, is that um, social media is is increasing the possibility for citizen empowerment and increasing the possibility for decision makers in each country to connect more directly with its citizens. However, the citizen empowerment, again, um, can also be used uh, to uh, maybe have a, 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 another bad effect. Um, I, we know, for example, that um, uh, ISIS and ISIL are, are using social media to recruit more terrorists very effectively. So again, each of these trends has a good side and a bad side. So how do we then, um, how do we affect this? How do, what, how do we as librarians do what we need to do to position libraries and our profession to be successful and to help our clients and the people that we work with take advantage of the good side of all of these trends. How do we how do we go down the good path? So it's we have discussions about them and what we would like to see and, and visualize as the library of the future. But it is not enough just to talk about the trends. We have to act. So that's why I'd like to call this libraries a call to action. Because what all of these trends represent are an opportunity. And if you have not seen the IFLA trend report yet, yet you can go to www.ifla.org and you'll see the trend report um, right on the front page. You can click on it and there is a wealth of information there. There's a, there's a, uh, the, the report itself, but there's all the backup information in the large, long lists, reading lists, etc. the papers written by our experts. So there's much for you to explore there. Um, but it's, it's okay to talk about trends, but we have to do something about it. So the way to think about what we can do is really on four levels. There's a personal level. Uh, what do I as a professional do to make sure I continue to have the adequate skills that will position me for success in this rapidly changing world? Our jobs are evolving and changing and we must evolve and change with them. The second is at the institutional level. Um, so what, does, what do libraries need to do to become the libraries of the future? What do, what do special um, uh, libraries or special, special uh, uh, groups such as the um, information centers here need to do in order to evolve to, to, to produce 21st century services for their, their clients and the people that they work with? The, the third is the national policy level. Many of the things that, that are needed in countries around the world can only be affected at, at the national level. I think even, you know, in the United States, for example, in the 1990s, we had the first uh, White House conference um, uh, on information policy, libraries and information policy. And out of that came some wonderful pieces of legislation and a wonderful working agenda that, that really set the stage for um, uh, being able to, um, in the, both public libraries and the academic libraries and in the special libraries, to be able to, to move forward. Um, we have not had a uh, White House conference since, um, and I keep thinking it would be a wonderful thing for us to, it's time for the United States again to have a, um, a national policy summit because there are many things around uh, copyright and uh, e-lending and uh, we were very happy of course to see the new net neutrality uh, regulations that the FCC has but I think we were, are probably going to have to um, continue to let our decision makers know that that is important that to not leave people out for, the, to be, for there to be a level playing field with net neutrality. So there are things like this that, that library associations especially can be effective in 
bringing positions of librarians together. In many countries, this has to do with salaries and hiring as well, and standards for that. Um, if you went to the UN, you'd probably find many uh, people there saying that gender equality might be part, part of this, this uh, agenda as well. So, so there are many things that library associations particularly need to do at their national level. And finally, and, and importantly for me, is the global agenda. So what is IFLA doing uh, about uh, making sure that libraries are positioned uh, for success? Well, there's one very, very important uh, pr process going on right now. Uh, the United Nations has what they call their development goals. And Every, uh, they last for 15 years, so the, the last, the millennial goals are, are being completed this year. So the UN is now in the process of setting goals for the next 15 years. So this is very important. And what these goals do is set the investment agenda for priorities for development in all countries, not just developing countries. And so, uh, IFLA took a look at this as an opportunity uh, for us to make the case about how important libraries are, particularly in bridging, bridging the digital divide. Um, you may be interested to know that there are 230,000 public libraries in the world. In every country has public libraries. And these are the places where people can go um, when they don't have access to technology themselves. Maybe they don't have computers at home. Maybe they can't afford uh, internet connections and to pay the fees for this. But they can go to their library and many important services are now being uh, delivered through the internet like applying for jobs and positions, applying for government programs in your country. So the people who, who need these things the most are the people who are, there's a kind of poverty in the world that doesn't get talked about often enough, information poverty. And without access to information, you cannot um, uh, achieve uh, personal goals or national goals as well. So this is the point, uh, we decided that we needed a campaign. We needed to make this real for people. And so, uh, we have partner organizations such as Beyond Access and IREX and many, and we got together to draft and publish the Lyon Declaration on Access to Information. And what this says is that in order to have many informed citizens, in order to be able to uh, for citizens to be able to exercise their economic, social, and political rights and to have them. That information, access to information is the foundation for all of the other goals that the UN might be discussing, whether it is, whether it is to um, uh, uh, increase crop production so that there is more food for a country, whether it is to have clean water or a better environment, or a more educated population. Access to information is the foundation. So uh, that is what the Lyon Declaration says. And over, right now, over 530 organizations have signed this. 60% of these are in the library field. But what is really good and important and, and makes us stronger when we talk about this is that 40% of these come from other areas, such as, um, again, uh, journalist organizations. There's an International Association of Broadcasters that is signed. Um, there are social service organizations. Uh, there are uh, education organizations. And there are internet um, governance and internet um, uh, lobbying, for want of a better word, organizations that are all part of this. So uh, we are continuing to have organizations signed, um, and we will continue to do this until the, the goals are actually set. 
Um, but we are now engaging in a brought the Leone Declaration to the United Nations. So two weeks ago, I was at the UN, um, and it was uh, the first day all of the member states uh, had um, the ambassadors gave speeches, and uh, they, there are many coalitions there as well. And uh, the next day, uh, the organizations that were there were allowed to speak. So it was my opportunity to introduce them to the Lyon Declaration and to tell the member states and their ambassadors that libraries are the natural partner for them in trying to connect citizens to the information that they will need to reach these goals. And so when they're looking at investment uh, and investment priorities in their countries, that there's a, there is a uh, theory in, in economics um, that they call the multiplier effect, that there are things that you can invest in and that by investing in that, that is a further investment because it helps people. Uh, so a library, investing in libraries has a multiplier effect because you're investing in something that then reaches out and, and brings others to the information, hopefully to help them with their own personal economies, whether, whether it be farming, whether it be getting a job, whether it be getting a better education, all of those things. Whether it's health, health is another big area for this, and we have many health organizations who have joined us in this effort. So we have begun this effort at the UN. I will be back there again in two weeks to talk about indicators. And um, we are hoping that all of the IFLA members will join us as well to let their ambassadors and their UN delegations know about the declaration, what, how libraries can be an important part of any country's development strategy, and that we're here and we're ready to be partners with our governments in helping them uh, invest for the future. The ultimate goal, and this is a very ambitious goal, the UN uh, wants to eradicate poverty by 2030. Again, a very ambitious goal. But I think libraries are a major partner and could help to do this. And um, so we are, we are trying to uh, make the case for you. So I'm going to stop talking now because I've said many things and I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say and questions that you might have. So please um, chime in. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. There are a few questions that actually um, you've already answered to, so maybe uh, we can go um, forward. Um, for instance, uh, Pablo wanted to know about the Leon Declaration and the meeting you had in, uh, in New York at the UN headquarters. What about the next meeting you are going to have? The next, the next meeting this month, they're talking about indicators because it is very important to be able to measure progress. And it is important actually for us as um, not only as organizations but as individuals uh, to see, to be able to see if our country has signed on to these goals, that our country is actually making progress towards these goals. So we have many um, indicators already uh, that we are bringing forward to the UN about libraries and information and about access, more importantly, about access to information. For example, the World Bank has this survey every year about how citizens are connected to the internet. We have information about, as I mentioned, we know there are 230,000 public libraries in the world. So, um, and we have indicators about who uses them and, and what kinds of things they can do. So, uh, an investment in libraries as well. So, we will be bringing our indicators to the discussion. I find it a little interesting because the goals are not set yet, and usually, um, it's been my experience that you set, you, you decide what you want to measure first, and then you talk about how to measure it. But here we are not doing that quite, quite that way. So we're talking about what are the indicators in many of these areas um, without having set the goals yet. Um, the goals, the, the target date for setting the, having the goals published 
is uh, the end of September, I believe, but I've already heard that perhaps it may be take, it may take a little bit longer than that. But the Pope is coming to the UN in, um, in uh, September. He's coming to the United States as well. And uh, I think it was the hope that while he was there, there would be this discussion about eradicating poverty and all of the goals that you would have to reach in order to do that. Because as we know, poverty crosses many, many um, fields and many, many parts of society. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Anthony wants to know uh, how can librarians around the world uh, get involved in the EFLAT trend? Great question, Anthony. Thank you very much. Actually, one of the things that um, uh, we hope that you um, will do, and we provided a toolkit on the Leon Declaration, which is on the IFLA website. So again, one of the things, besides the trend report, the, the text of the Leon Declaration, uh, a list of all of the signers that have signed so far, and then the toolkit that will help you um, do two things, really. One is if your libraries and organizations would, you have ones that you would like to invite to sign, uh, the information about how to approach that and a copy of the declaration that you can give them, that you can download from the website, all of that is there. There are talking points. Um, we also, though, help, help hope that um, particularly if you're a member of a library association, that you will talk to your association about sending delegations to try to talk to your decision makers, both at the national level and as the delegates to the UN, to again, to make them more aware of the, the declaration. Because when I stand up and say there that I am representing 530 organizations, that they see one person, they hear one voice. And it is very important that they hear many more voices than that, because that's what politicians respond to. They respond to um, the majority of people. They respond to the people they hear the loudest. And so it's very important that you help me by adding your voice, um, by talking to your decision makers, and by getting more organizations to sign. Those would be the two best things that you can do. But there is much information about this on the info website. Great, thank you. So not only you said that not only like library organizations can sign, but yeah, any yes. other kind of okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, especially to um, you know you, the kind of non-governmental organizations, maybe foundations that work in the inter international um, level. Um, your country's Red Cross organization, for example, would be would people uh, uh, organizations that respond to disasters, um, all kinds of organizations like that as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Sarah, Sarah wants to know um, about copyright. Are today's notions of copyright irrelevant in the new information environment? Well, that is one of the reasons why IFLA is very active at WIPO. WIPO is the World International property. Intellectual Property Organization. Mm -hmm. And um, that is where all the discussions about changes in the copyright, copyright law takes place. And so we have been active there, and so far we have had, um, we joined with the um, uh, organizations particularly representing the, the blind and the physically handicapped because it, one of the things that's important to have copyright exceptions for is to be able to make copies of things that, the, for example, the blind can read. And so last year, um, the treaty was finally passed for exceptions for blind and the physically handicapped at, at WIPO. So this was, this was our first um, victory in this area, and now it is around um, it, waiting um, to be ratified. It has gone out to many countries, and um, ratification discussions and legislation and whatever process each country uses, um, it's, it's now there for that to happen next. So we, now we are looking at exceptions for, for libraries, um, because as we know in the area of preservation especially, but things like e-lending rights, trying to put some balance back into the copyright law. 
because what has happened up to this point is that commercial publishers who also have been um, uh, are, are feeling the impacts of new technology. Their, their business has been disrupted as well. And so they are very concerned about their own futures and they have been using the copyright law as a way to protect what they have. But the copyright law is not supposed to um, only protect, it's there for, to make sure that creators, the creators are compensated and that the public has access to the, this information in order to be more creative and to produce new creativity within a country. So there's those two objectives, the, the people who are, are gaining the most from copy right now are not the creators. And that is why in the United States, for example, um, and with our own um, the American Library Association with its own efforts. And there's an authors organization that has joined us and many authors are on the side of the libraries now and not on the side of the commercial publishers. So we are trying, a, a, a new study just came out this week from a commission which, um, and if you go to the website, you can find out about this as well. We have issued a statement in support of this new study because this is the conclusion that it arrives at, that balance, it's telling the, the, uh, the leaders at WIPO that balance must be brought back to copyright. It's too in favor of the commercial side of things right now and does not do enough for both the creators and for the public who needs to be able to have access to this in order to be more creative themselves and produce new ideas, new thinking, and, and um, new forms of um, entertainment and reading and books and all of that. So that is where copyright is. And you can find out quite a bit. We will be back at, at WIPO, I think. They're reconvening sometime this summer. I, I, June, I think, May or June. And, um, but you can find out all about that on the Influ website as well. That's one of, the, one of the things that we try to do is to keep um, not only our members informed, but the, but the constituents of our members, the, the, the library users, all of the stakeholders and all of these issues. Thank you. So while we wait for uh, more questions, uh, I have a question myself. Okay, very good. <laughs> what about your American and uh, you are the president-elect of IFLA? I think it hasn't happened for a few Many years. Many years, yes. yes. I am only, the, the IFLA is um, over 75 years old, but in its history there, I am the third American to be president. And I, I was very grateful and I was, I was surprised in, in many ways because I um, I am very sensitive to the fact that uh, in, in many parts of the world um, America is seen as running everything you know mm -hmm. that we we take over things and so um, it's it's I have learned over time to appreciate um, that every culture has its own way of doing things and that if you're going to um, collaborate at the global level you have to be open to the ideas of others and you have to be open to other ways of doing things besides the way that you do it in America for example for me so that has helped me I think and it helped me gain trust which I, I mean all, all leaders I think um, have to have trusted people. And so I've been very fortunate because I see this election as people saying that they trust me to, to um, be inclusive. And, and uh, so that has been, that has been a, um, I give it, actually do a talk on uh, global projects and, and the, um, the things that we have to do to be successful to work across bound, national boundaries and across cultures. And, and it's, it's really based on what I have learned over time working through IFLA, particularly in the um, uh, 
My section is the Library and Research Services for Parliaments, which is a very interesting section. And, and uh, we have, um, it's interesting particularly because uh, there is representation from every country and because there's sort of a, uh, you know, a designated group um, for that, for each country. So we, when we have our IFLA meetings, we often have um, somewhere around 70 countries or 80 countries represented at our IFLA meetings. So that, that kind of exposure, I think, helps a great deal to, to um, expand your thinking about um, how to go about um, collaborating as a, as a good global collaborator. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So we have a guest, and he wants to know, does IFLA regard international financial institutions as natural partners in highlighting and implementing the Lyon Declaration to financial? I, we, of course we would, because what this is, yes, what this is about is investment, you know. Um, getting the attention of some of the international, we, 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 um, had actually the librarians at the World Bank proposed that the World Bank sign the Lyon Declaration, but I, they, they, the leadership there thought it was not going to be appropriate for the World Bank since they have so much to say about other things that taking, they thought, taking a position on one part of this was not going to be appropriate. But, but um, that does not mean that we would not continue to ask um, a variety of uh, financial um, organizations, but also particularly um, foundations, because foundations are very important in this as well. And I think of like, for example, the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation, um, because they, they invest a lot of that foundations, their money in uh, international efforts. And so so the, the UN um, development goals will be important to foundations like that in determining what their investment strategies are going to be for the next 15 years as well. So it's very important that we consider them and, and work with them because that's where the investment is going to come from. Right. Thank you. Um, so, um, Amir wants to know about how can libraries uh, respond to new technologies that challenge the boundaries of privacy, like wearable technology, information mining. Well, I mean, this is a good dis this is a good discussion for you to have, I think, as well, because uh, again, um, th there are uh, a number of ways to do this, but what is appropriate needs to come out of your, you know, your um, uh, experience, your regional experience and, and how people respond to this. But I know that many libraries are now starting to develop um, programs for uh, uh, their, their users. Um, they, they will do a little program, a little seminar for them or discussions in the library about informing them about um, how their privacy is affected and the kinds of things that, that they might do on the computer that they don't realize where the information is being shared. So, so it, it's kind of like um, privacy literacy in some ways, you know, and, and the, best way, the best way to help people is by informing them. And so, so libraries are starting to do more in this area. So that's one suggestion. Um, that I think, you know, is helpful. I, <coughs> um, but I'm sure there are other ideas, and if anybody out there has them, I wish you would please, you, you know, please join in and suggest things. You need not only ask questions, you can make comments and help our discussion here, too. Yeah, um, yeah there, are, there might be many people, but not everybody chooses to, to send questions and, yeah, prefers to, to listen. Um, uh, we don't have any more questions. If you, do you have anything you would like to add? I would like to talk a little for a few couple minutes just about to go on this this um, area of global collaboration because I think it is important for, for libraries the fact that our our boundaries have, have um, greatly disappeared here. It makes it possible for us to think about projects that we can do together. 
And um, and it may be around a subject area. For example, there's the wonderful world of the biodiversity um, heritage program that many libraries participate in. Um, it may it may be th just thinking about if, for example, if you're a law librarian and a law firm, and your firm is a global firm. But you, but I think we we need to be looking at these as as wonderful opportunities for global knowledge management and um, how we working together to contribute to some kind of common um, repository of information is a, is a um, is also a way to break down not just barriers between libraries but but to also understand other cultures better because these kinds of projects work best when everybody brings their own regional, if you're contributing information, that you're sort of in control of how that information is presented. Um, the Library of Congress for a long time had something called the Global Legal Information Network that the law library ran. And each country contributed laws in their own language and um, a sum, but in English they, and their own language, they presented a summary of the law. And they were responsible for interpreting and saying what this law said. And so it's important that people read, people contribute things, but in retain ownership of it in an intellectual way. So there's so many interesting things that, that you can think about in, in terms of how you might work with other libraries in other countries to pull together information that is important and is needed by the world. And, uh, and in the process of doing that, um, you, will, you will probably gain more understanding and um, more appreciation for um, other cultures and other regions but through the process of working together to, to build something together. So if you have opportunities to do that, I highly recommend it. Thank you very much. Very well. interesting, Donna. Thank you very much for being with us today, and we, we say goodbye <laughs> to you. And thank you, and I hope you will go to www.ifla.org to learn more about what we talked about today. Thank you very much.